Last Sunday before we start Lent, and it's always the same reading from the different Gospels. Uh, it's the reading of the Transfiguration, Jesus on the mountaintop in dazzling white. As I was thinking about that, as we are on this mountain preparing for our journey towards the cross, our Lenten journey, I thought about what it is to be on the mountaintop. What do you see on the mountaintop? And I was skiing this weekend uh, with my, my family, and I looked around at the very top, and you can see in every direction, and it is incredible. But it gives you perspective. Carving out your path that you're going to go. You're, you're seeing the moguls and all the obstacles in your way. You're looking back at where you came from. And you can see your past, your present, and your future as you prepare to go forward. As I look back on my past, I realize that in the valley, so much is going on that sometimes you don't have perspective. I also realize that this is, in many ways, a mountaintop year. I can think of very little time where so much ministry is taking place or coming to fruition. We celebrate our bicentennial 200 years. We celebrate that after three years, we are rolling out our preschool initiative that we've been working beneath the surface for so long. St. James continues to build almost seemingly weekend after weekend. We planned our renovation and expansion after years and years of drawing and revising those drawings. It's finally bearing fruit of all the work day to day that takes place. But also, I had to be honest, from the mountaintop, and I look back and I see when I was first ordained, when I was in my, my late 20s, and I, I thought about what ministry looked like then, uh, before I had children, before I had all of the uh, responsibilities that come with, with all of the ministry taking place. And there's some things that they've got lost along the way. I have to admit, when I was first ordained, I loved to come up with a, a Christian ed program. I loved to spend hours pouring over all of my seminary resources and showing everybody all the stuff I had learned during those three years. I'm sure their heads were spinning, but over time, that softens as you get more and more different places that you, uh, that you hang your hat. And I remember the, uh, the passion I had for, for outreach, which I still have at the very central of, uh, center of my ministry, but you know, back then I was on uh, the floor Boots on, first one out the door, and my teeth were sharper. They were sharper for justice in the world. They were sharper for the church's engagement in what's beyond these doors. I also remember pastoral care. I was smart enough then to know that I didn't know very much. And I was smart enough to know that the people that I was listening to, the people who'd had years and years of, of life experience, had so much to offer, and I was less encumbered by other obligations that I was more present. And I think I was more effective in that regard. And I tell you all this, uh, uh, not to beat myself up, because I hope that you all have that realization that as your world expands, that some things, uh, some things come and go, and you have to realize, how do we prioritize? I can't continue to be the same minister I was 15 years ago. There isn't enough time or hours in the day, but how do I continue to, to balance my life so that I can be the father I want to be, the husband I want to be, the pastor I want to be. I get the opportunity to, uh, to follow in my dad and grandfather's footsteps of running the business uh, part of, uh, of, of the church. I get, to, uh, I get to work with an incredible vestry that's doing amazing things, but it's a different form of ministry. And so when I stand on the mountaintop and think of all the things going on, I also have to think about where I've been and where I want my ministry to go to make sure I have that balance, to make sure I keep all of these things in tension. And I think Jesus, as he stood on the mountaintop, had, had a similar reflection of where he's been and where God has been with God's people, all the way back to Moses, the story we heard read, uh, where God promised to lead his people out of slavery into freedom and the mantle that he is carrying from that story, promising to lead his people out of the slavery of sin and death and brokenness into new life. As he looks back and he uh, remembers the, the, the baptism that's echoed so fully in the story as well, the, the, the baptism where the skies opened up and God again spoke to him and said, this is my child, my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. The story on the mountaintop also echoes things yet to come. In Luke, it says it's on the eighth day, the same day as the resurrection. And when he goes down that mountain, we hear that the, the next exodus is to Jerusalem. The next exodus will come through the cross. So he's preparing for his death and resurrection, and he looks and he sees the course to Jerusalem. 
He remembers back from the backside of the mountain the promises uh, that his disciples made, the, uh, the, the epiphany that Peter had that this is indeed the Messiah. But he also looks forward to the, the fact that Peter will deny him and have his heart broken. He sees all of it clearly as he prepares to journey towards the cross. And we have this phenomenal opportunity, a gift that's given to us to stand on that mountain, to think about where we've come from, where we've grown, where we'd like to get back to, and court course our way forward, set our path towards Jerusalem, towards our cross, towards our relationship with God. I was thinking about what it is to have that moment, that mountaintop moment where we see things clearly and we get a glimpse of, of, of what journey needs to happen. And I had, uh, had the opportunity to read out about a few times a year. I get enough time to pull away and read some nonfiction. And I, I read, uh, the boys in the boat, which is a phenomenal book, uh, and they talk about this thing called the swing. It's about the 1936 gold medal U.S. rowing team. There were students from uh, University of Washington, a part of the country that uh, never uh, really rose to prominence uh, much before this time in, uh, in U.S. rowing uh, that was sort of dominated by the Ivy League, uh, the New England schools, uh, much less globally. Uh, but this team from, Calif um, from Washington State and the teams from California uh, had risen to prominence, and it's about uh, their journey uh, towards the Olympics. And in this, uh, the being in the swing is that moment of perfect synchronicity between the team, so where each one of the rowers loses a little bit of themselves to the whole, and they work in absolute motion where they're gliding across the water. And they said it's a transcendent experience. Some rowers row their whole life and never get to that moment uh, of transcendence, that moment of being in the swing. Uh, and this team from Washington, there are a lot of uh, uh, Blue collar uh, uh, logmen's children, and, and they've they've had more of a, a rough scramble uh, life, but uh, but they're physically so imposing, and they they row faster than you can imagine. Uh, but they're having a tough time getting into the swing, and they have moments, little moments of clarity where they're there, uh, but they always seem to lose it. And uh, they think this gentleman, uh, Joe Rance. Uh, is, is part of the problem, is that uh, he is physically capable, but he just seems to always fall out of sync. Uh, and uh, the whole book starts with this man, Joe Rance, reflecting on being in the boat. And as the, the author asks him about being in the boat, he realizes, the writer, that this is not just about being in the boat, but a metaphor for his whole life. The boat is where he got clarity about the rest of his life. Uh, and as the tears stream down his face, uh, and as he seemed to be absent words to express it, uh, the story comes to tell how he learned where his journey had to go by being in the boat. So when they would take him out of the boat, uh, the boat would always go slower, and they realized that they needed him in the boat, but they needed to figure out why he wasn't clicking with the rest of the team, why they'd have moments of getting towards the swing, of being in the swing, but not being able to sustain it. Uh, and then finally, from being in that place, he has this epiphany uh, that he needs to realize that he needs to depend on other people. Then we look back on his life, we realize his, uh, his mother died at a very young age, his, his dad remarried, and uh, the, 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 the new mother and stepmother uh, always resented Joe, and uh, eventually, at a tender age, uh, he comes home from school, and his dad is packing the last things uh, of their possessions into the back of, uh, of, the, of the car and has to go and tell Joe, you're not coming with us. Uh, the, the rest of the children from the other new marriage uh, are all in the back seat, and he says to, uh, to Joe, you, you can't come. I'm sorry. And so Joe basically raises himself. He goes from place to place. Uh, but he learned that he can only depend on himself. And part of that toughness, part of that uh, resolution is what made him such a ferocious athlete, but it's also part of what kept him from ever being able to get into the swing because he had to lose something of himself. But when he was in the boat and he realized what it was like, he realized what his journey was. In order for him to be part of that team, to get in synchronicity with all of the other people, he had to figure out how to open himself up to let people in, to trust again, to be part of something bigger than himself. And we see his journey. Each of us have a journey, and sometimes we need to be in the boat or on the mountaintop to realize it, to realize where God is working on us and where God wants us to go, where we've been, where we stand, and what's cast ahead of us. So we stand three days before this incredible opportunity that God has given us. This chance to draw our lives closer to its ultimate purpose,
closer to one another, closer to being in the swing with God and God's will for us and God's love for us, where does our journey need to take us? What do we need to do to get there? That's what this Sunday is all about, setting our course so that we can take advantage of this gift and arrive on the other side of the tomb more ready to live a risen life.